This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. can spread and ripple across 
the world over generations. Since 1971, the Commonwealth Fund for Technical Cooperation, the CFTC, has been working as a trusted partner, building capacity in areas of human rights, governance, health, education, and economic development, working to give nations a voice, helping to develop policy, and by providing training and expertise from within the Commonwealth family, creating ripples that change lives. In the heart of rural India, Sarasana gathers mulberry branches. The leaves will provide food for her farm of silkworms. In 30 days, when they weave their fine threads into a cocoon, she will sell them in the market. Like many women over the world, she knows she has the potential to achieve more. The CFTC, working together with the Corporation Bank and local partner NTR, provides her with the training and support she needs. What uh, a CFTC is doing through this initiative is primarily ensuring that women-owned micro and small enterprises are able to absorb that level of finance that is going to be provided by the banks at a concessional rate. Empowering women like Sara Suma to reach her potential. Women are a problem in uh, getting finance because they don't know how to prepare the positive reports. They don't know how to talk to the bankers. Uh, drastic changes will come if, uh, if this project goes succeeds, you know, like uh, economically they grow and they can sustain on their own. Deep in the remote Pacific island of Vanuatu, Rutha Wilson is working hard to establish a fledgling brick-making business. To help her business grow, she needs financial skills and access to the banking system. The CFTC has trained mobile loans officers from the Central Bank of Vanuatu who take the bank to the customer. We first started off running a train the train program for the loan officers who were working out in the, in the islands. It allows them to go and deliver the training in the rural areas rather than having to bring people to the mainland. We funded training seminars targeting um, the rural population and we also did training documents in the local language. The CFTC also supports a twice weekly radio program to help improve the financial literacy of all islanders. Helping people like Rutha build a future for herself, her family and her nation. The program of the uh, financial literacy education has brought about additional education, additional knowledge to the vast majority of uh, those who have been out there never had any chance of actually coming forward with the bank. We've been able to open uh, more than 6,000 accounts that has been over 1 million US dollars mobilized in rural areas into savings accounts.
administration of justice in this country. This intervention is monumental to us and it's a big footprint that the, the Commonwealth has left uh, with the, the social justice system.
Um, okay, this public here, and um, uh, this was um, a part of the, this video deals with a part of the work of the Commonwealth Secretariat, uh, but um, you could also see in the website later on uh, other areas of the work with. But the point I was I wanted to stress through this video was the, the diversity of work that Commonwealth does and the range of things that um, that they do, and also the the range of people whom they are uh, that they are benefiting. Now I'd like to invite um, Vijay Krishnan, who is the director of Commonwealth. Um, Foundation, which is the other organization, and in your welcome packs, um, you might have seen uh, two um, two items there. One is the Commonwealth People, which is uh, a journal that they bring out, and the second one is the Commonwealth uh, is the uh, Civil Society Statement, of the Commonwealth um, Foundation's Stakeholders Forum, and uh, so both are available. But I think nothing like hearing from. Vijay Insat, please. I'm happy here. You're happy there? Yeah, I'm happy here. That's okay. Fine. And just, just to fill in, um, the, the Commonwealth Foundation uh, deals with uh, a range of um, things, but you know, one of the major aspects is, the, uh, is that, that they focus on civil society and people-to-people -people contacts. And it's very important that you, know, you, you um, see this. And then after that um, presentation, uh, we'll have a brief discussion, uh, finishing off at 5.30, and mainly looking at how Commonwealth institutions, educational institutions, uh, can form together uh, something that benefits the Commonwealth as a whole, but also a question of language. Over to you. Excuse me. I think you'll be recording. Oh. Yes. Right, okay. okay. In that case, uh. thanks for the reminder. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for the uh, for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I just wanted to start by um, by thanking the Institute of Commonwealth Studies and the uh, the Higher Education Academy for supporting this uh, this event. Um, I've only been um, privileged enough to uh, join you for the last part of the day, um, but certainly from what I heard um, that came before, um, it sounded very very well worthwhile and of a high quality as well. I'm particularly sad that I missed the, uh, the session on Bhojpuri because uh, as a, a national of Trinidad and Tobago, it's something that we grew up with um, in my own home, um, both in this country and in Trinidad. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing the transcript, uh, the recording of that session and taking something from it. The, I should also pay tribute to uh, Chandra and the hard work that he's done in putting this together. Mm -hmm. Putting a, a, an activity like this uh, together it takes an enormous amount of work and, uh, mm -hmm. and well done you for doing it and getting such a diverse range of quality speakers as well. Present company accepted. <laughs> I, um, I did want to just take you quickly through the work of the Commonwealth Foundation. Um, we're very much the small sister of the Commonwealth Secretariat. There are two intergovernmental organisations based in London, affiliated to the Commonwealth. And um, the Commonwealth Foundation, based in the same building as the Commonwealth Secretariat, um, is very much the junior partner. But a significant partner nevertheless. You know, the Commonwealth Secretariat and the Foundation were established in 1965 to give the Commonwealth an independent bureaucracy to support this new institution called the Commonwealth. And whereas the Commonwealth Secretariat was established to help broker conventional diplomacy and exchange between member states, between governments, heads of government at that time also recognised the need for and the importance of bringing together people, the non-governmental side of the Commonwealth. They recognised even then, before we came up with the term civil society that we use often, we all use often today. That if the Commonwealth meant anything, it meant something more than just an association of governments. It meant uh, and was epitomized by the exchanges between 
um, individuals, groups, associations, and networks, many of which predate 1965 and the establishment of both the Commonwealth Foundation and the Commonwealth Secretariat. So whereas the Secretariat was established to broker this conventional diplomacy between member states, the Commonwealth Foundation was established to take care of everything else. You know, as the colonial administrations withdrew, governments were looking for ways in which that professional class, that cadre of professionals that required to establish and, um, and help nascent independent countries grow, um, needed to be nurtured. And so the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth Foundation was established to help the development of that professional class initially. So for example, um, foresters, general practitioners, engineers, these associations have been getting together and networking across the Commonwealth for a long, long time. And the Commonwealth Foundation was established to strengthen those networks, enable exchange, and help embed that professional layer in each independent, newly independent country. Over time, of course, the foundation has expanded its mandate as our understanding of the importance of the people's dimension of the Commonwealth has grown. So in 1982, the mandate of the foundation was expanded beyond these professional guilds, networks and associations to encompass and reach civil society as we now come to know it. Non-governmental organisations working in each um, Commonwealth country. So in each of your countries there will be a, an association, an organisation working on a development issue or a single issue. Those are the kinds of organisations that um, now we call our partners uh, and colleagues. 1982, the early, early 80s, it was a significant time. At that time, the, found that the, the Commonwealth was struggling with the um, issue of um, uh, apartheid and um, the need to isolate the, uh, the white regime in, Rhodesia, in what was then Rhodesia. And as they came to terms with the need to isolate those racist regimes, governments became to came to fully understand the importance of a, a non-governmental dimension to polity. They recognised that if regimes like that were to be excluded and isolated, it required not just action by governments, but also needed to tap into and mobilise individual citizens' concerns and their action and energy as well. And so in 1982, after the um, Melbourne Heads of Government meeting, after the ninth, highly significant 1979 Heads of Government meeting as well, where Rhodesia was a substantive agenda item, the mandate of the Commonwealth Foundation was changed to embrace that broader range of non-governmental actors. From there, we've grown um, to... Uh, to support those non-governmental organisations in a wide range of fields through grants, through programmes, and through enabling organisations to um, have their say in Commonwealth political processes. I should say a little bit about our grants work. Um, we, uh, we have a very small budget, but we make sure that £1 million of that is dispersed every year in grants. Some of that is reserved for Commonwealth accredited organisations, networks, associations. But the vast majority of it is dedicated to enabling um, Commonwealth non-governmental organisations from the global south to exchange with each other. Our programmes focus on two areas, culture and, broadly speaking, capacity development for um, civil society. On the capacity development side, we support leadership, leadership exchanges, accountability materials, uh, strengthen the capacity of non-governmental organisations to engage with governments. On the culture side, the Commonwealth Foundation has for the past 25 years administered something called the Commonwealth Writers' Prize. And this year, um, we've revised it and updated that prize. We want to use the prize very much as a vehicle to encourage new writing 
And so we've merged it with another prize that we have been, write, uh, have been um, running called um, the Commonwealth Short Stories Award. Um, you may have heard that on, uh, on radio in, um, in any, of, uh, any of your countries. You might have been driving home from work, turn the radio on, you'll hear a short story. That short story is likely to have been generated by the Commonwealth Short Stories um, Award. But our thesis in revising our culture work is that um, there is a need in the Commonwealth to make writing more accessible. Um, of course there's a need to celebrate excellence in the field of literature, but also, increasingly, we want to encourage new writers, new writing. We also want to stimulate a debate on the future of publishing. In our analysis over the past 25 years, if we look at where the, the, the winners of the Writers' Prize have come from, they have, by and large, come from the usual places, uh, South Africa, uh, Australia, Canada, Britain, countries where there's an established publishing industry. We want to do something about that. And we want to ride, and interested, I was interested in the discussion that took place in the prior session on um, the way in which um, web technologies and online technologies are changing the nature of the way in which we educate and learn. The same is also true for publishing. And the whole wave of new, and, uh, new forms and approaches to publishing, self-publishing in particular, um, that we hope will enable more and more entrants to writing. Uh, so, if our two interventions are primarily through um, programmes and through grants, I want to touch now on the way in which we have taken up this year's Commonwealth theme of connecting cultures, the theme that you've chosen for um, today's symposium. When the Heads of Government revised the mandate of the Commonwealth Foundation, they gave us the specific mandate to work on culture. So we're the only intergovernmental Commonwealth agency that works on culture. And our understanding of that has changed over time um, uh, since, since, since we were given that mandate in 1982. Whereas throughout the 80s and 90s, I think we took a, a lazy approach to interpreting culture. I think that's fair to say. For us, culture in those days meant is actually the singing and dancing bits that um, kicked off conferences and closed conferences. I think over time we've understood, we've come to understand that culture has a much more powerful and important role to play in the political message that comes with the Commonwealth. And ever since um, the early 2000s, the Commonwealth Foundation has revised and updated its approach to um, engaging with culture. And this is very much part and parcel of the way in which we've tackled the Commonwealth Writers' Prize. It's not enough to have and celebrate the esoteric or intrinsic nature of uh, literature. It's also important to locate literature in a developmental context for us. This year's theme of connecting cultures, I should say that the theme, and you might be asking yourselves, how is it? comes up with this theme, Connecting Cultures. Well, last year the theme was Connecting Cultures. The, the theme is selected by, um, by the head of the Commonwealth, by Her Majesty, on recommendation from um, the Secretary General of the Commonwealth. We were delighted that um, last year the theme was selected as Connecting Cultures because it speaks squarely to the majority of the work that the Commonwealth Foundation does. To mark um, Connecting Cultures last year, we did a number of things. I've got a little um, leaflet here, which I'll, um, I'll distribute when I've, uh, when I've done, but I wanted to draw your attention to a few things. I've spoken a little bit, little bit about Commonwealth writers, and I'd encourage you to visit to Google Commonwealth writers, all one word, and you'll see there an online a web portal, if you could get, that would be great, an online web portal that aims to connect new writers and put them in touch with established writers, encourage them to tell their stories about their experience of engaging with um, the publishing industry, uh, and um, also make a provision for um, writers in residence, for example, to exchange um, information. In the Caribbean, for example, um, we've helped to establish a Caribbean action group on literature. 
because in the Caribbean there aren't many publishing houses. There are one or two that do good work. But to make publishing, to make writing more accessible, we recognise the need to open up the publishing industry, particularly in small states. You'll have heard small states made reference to several times in the last video. That's because in the Commonwealth, of our 54 member states, 32 are small states. When we, when we say small states, we use the UN measure of a small state. That is a population of less than 1.5 million people. In addition to um, the Commonwealth writers, um, there's a, another initiative that we've taken this year called Commonwealth Shorts. Commonwealth Shorts is a, 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 an initiative that aims to encourage the making of short films. Short films that encourage discussion on issues that might be difficult for the Commonwealth, either collectively or individually, to come to terms with. This, this initiative uh, recognises that culture as a medium to enable diplomacy um, is, uh, is very valuable. So, Commonwealth Shorts attracted hundreds of applications and proposals for short films. We selected eight, and the call that we made this year for Commonwealth Shorts was under the heading of, um, of Love and Relationships. Mm. That would enable um, some quite controversial themes to be discussed. Not as documentaries, because we expect them to stand alone as fine films, but as works of art that will stimulate discussion and provoke. The third initiative that we've taken is in conjunction with um, a, a, our partner in the Netherlands, not a, not a Commonwealth country, um, the Prince Klaus Fund. And that, sorry, so, so we found the, yep. it's been able, it took a little while to, um, to upload, but that's because there's quite a lot of dynamic content on the, on the site. But I'd encourage you, those of you who are interested in the literate environment, please do take a look at this. I think you'll find it very, um, very interesting. Getting back to the, um, the initiative that we're taking with the Prince Klaus Fund in the Netherlands, this again speaks to the idea of using culture as a medium for diplomacy. So we're working with Prince Klaus to look at ways in which culture and cultural expression can be used to help in post-conflict situations in four countries, post-conflict reconstruction, in Pakistan, Rwanda, Zimbabwe, and Sri Lanka. Working with non-governmental organizations and, and uh, cultural practitioners in each of those countries, looking at ways in which uh, cultural practice, art forms, can help um, healing and reconstruction. Of course, um, the activities for um, the Commonwealth theme are focused on Commonwealth Week. Commonwealth and Commonwealth Day in particular. Commonwealth Day is always the, um, the second Monday of March. It's the second Monday of March because that's the only day on the Commonwealth calendar when every school child is in school. There's no public holiday on the second mo Monday of Mar March for some reason. This year, to start and uh, to start off the Commonwealth Week celebrations, um, we were very um, lucky to have uh, Hugh Masakela and Zara McFarlane um, perform at the Barbican. Um, uh, a lovely concert, 2,000 people, sold out in a matter of hours. I can't tell you the last time that any Commonwealth event sold out in a couple of hours, but we were very pleased with that. And then to end the week, we had the Commonwealth Lecture, delivered this year by uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, uh, a previous Commonwealth Writers' Prize winner, who spoke very eloquently on the power of um, realism in fiction, but also in delivering that lecture. And again, I commend that text to you. If you go to the Commonwealth Foundation website, you'll be able to pick that up. Um, on the power of literature to help convey um, narratives that would otherwise find um, difficulty in getting exposure. So there's a little bit about the Commonwealth Foundation, a little bit about how we've interpreted um, connecting cultures, and a little bit about how we structure our work. Um, 
that's more than 10 minutes, mm -hmm. Chandra. Um, but perhaps I can take some questions uh, in response. Yes. Um, um, <coughs> thank you, Vijay, for this uh, ex excellent um, account of uh, the excellent work done by the Foundation uh, in these uh, matters. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm just thinking whether um, if you have any questions. Um, uh, and the websites, the two websites, I will email to everyone here uh, once uh, the event is over. But if you have any, uh, any questions to Vijay, please do. Um, from where do they come these funds? Who does it fund? Okay, the Cornwall Foundation is an intergovernmental organisation, so it's funded by our member states. And there are 54 Commonwealth member states, and to be a member of the Commonwealth Foundation, you have to be one of those 54. So it's a voluntary, and so countries opt into membership of the foundation. And to date, 46 um, Commonwealth countries. Uh, have opted to join the foundation. In return, each of them gives us uh, an annual um, subscription. Uh, it's important that um, the subscription is shared, so no one country pays more than 30%, but everyone has to pay something. So the ownership of the work of the foundation and its programs is shared. And the contribution that they have to do is in order the richness that the country has or...? It's a combination of GDP and, ability, and uh, an assessment of ability to pay, which we share with um, our colleagues at the Commonwealth Secretariat. And, uh, I'd like to ask about uh, the ways in, in which debt, debt management has changed. In, in, in you know countries that were overburdened by by their debt, because you mentioned debt management a number of times in the film as well. Yeah. Now I wish I was an expert in debt management. Um, however, the, the I should explain that the distinction between the two organisations, the Secretariat and the Commonwealth Foundation. The Commonwealth Secretariat, if you notice the film, the the film was shown um, before I before I spoke. It emphasised very much the role of the Secretariat in supporting governments. So to access the Commonwealth Fund for Technical Cooperation, uh, requests for assistance are only entertained from, uh, from governments themselves. The Commonwealth Foundation would not be eligible, nor would any non-governmental organisation be eligible to um, apply to the CFTC for funds. So we, at the Foundation, respond to these from civil society to, um, to address those. So that's an, that's an important ex uh, distinction. And in the context of culture, that's quite important, we think. And we hope that the Secretariat would be more amenable to opening up the CFTC to deal with requests for technical assistance in the cultural sphere. The difficulty with that is, that um, the drivers in the cultural sphere are largely from civil society, unless they're working quite closely with their ministers of ministries of culture. Um, that's all also difficult because ministries of culture are often linked, uh, lumped together with um, either education or youth, or in some bizarre cases, civil aviation or you know, uh, all manner of things. So that, that's a little distinction, and that's the reason why I'm not an expert in, in debt management. But I would say that um, uh, if I studied the work of the, of the Commonwealth Secretariat and their analysis of how debt has changed, uh, what, we, what we saw over the, certainly over the 90s and the early 2000s is um, a change from um, private debt, public debt, or debt uh, accrued as a result of borrowing from conventional sources, um, regional development banks, international development, development banks, and so on to um, private debt, um, what are sometimes called vulture funds, um, um, private private sources of income and so on. Um, and that 
member states often found treating with those private debts a little more difficult uh, and uh, restructuring the repayment of those debts a little more difficult than um, debt from public sector sources. You say that you you distribute a million pounds to be found in various organisations. Is it uh, within the Commonwealth or just in the UK? Across the Commonwealth. We fund very little work in the UK. Um, because our emphasis is in, in enabling um, civil society organisations from um, developing Commonwealth countries to exchange and learn from each other. That is not to say that we don't fund work in the UK. And under the Connecting Cultures theme this year, we launched a special strand of grant making to support that theme. That meant that we got quite a lot of interest in our work from um, diaspora organisations based in this country. And we ended up funding two of those, both based in Birmingham, to uh, make connections with um, Caribbean countries. So connecting the Caribbean diaspora here, and Birmingham in particular, um, with um, colleagues and counterparts in the Caribbean region. So we have been known to fund things in this country, but it's usually around um, diaspora initiatives. Um, it, officially, yes, but unofficially, of course, connect, we're always connecting cultures. That's all, that's all we do. Um, and so I'd encourage you to stay in touch with the Foundation's website to take advantage of uh, new specificities in terms of the direction that our work is taking. But I, I can guarantee that culture will remain a part of our work in the future. That is a part, that's a mandate that's been given to us by, um, by heads of government. So we'll continue to work on that, script, on that strand. Um, it's very interesting and I have too many questions but I am going to be very short. Uh, when you were talking about these awards uh, for the writers, um, I suppose that they have to use English as their language? Yes. Of writing? Okay. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's quite a controversial area for us. Um, and there's, there's some interest in um, support for um, works in translation. Um, but we, if I'm honest, we don't have the resources to uh, to support that diversity of prize. Um, we pride ourselves on the fact that the Commonwealth Writers Prize, or Commonwealth Book Prize as we call it now, is international. So there's a regional winner, a regional winner for the Caribbean, regional winner for the Pacific, a uh, regional winner for Africa, and so on. And that differentiates it from um, other international literary prizes. Not only do we have individual regional prizes, but the judging is regionalised as well. Um, mm -hmm. But that's the extent of the internationalisation of the prize, I'm afraid. We don't have the resources to, um, to offer prizes for translation. Okay, um, so we, we have another 10 minutes and I'm trying to, uh, or less than 10 minutes, I'm um, trying to bring together this, uh, this last panel uh, to sort of take stock of the situation and to look into some areas uh, we might want to, want to look at the way the three themes get connected um, in terms of uh, connecting cultures, which uh, we just spoke about you know, from an institutional perspective how a particular institution within the Commonwealth um, organizations is handling that. And then uh, in the morning, uh, Philip talked about how the institute is looking at it, and he mentioned about um, the, some work that has been done before in this, uh, in this area. For example, I organized uh, <coughs> two, two, two seminar series last year and the year before on language policy and practice in the Commonwealth. And those uh, the, um, the sort of monthly um, events throughout the year, uh, ending with a symposium towards the end, and uh, they mainly looked at the issues of uh, policy, language policy in different Commonwealth countries, 
in terms of uh, not just uh, Anglophone countries, but also Lusophone of, of Mozambique, and also uh, countries where um, English coexists with French, for example, in Cameroon. So uh, one of the areas that we looked at in this particular series in, at the Institute looked at the diversity of language practice, of, of, of policy as well as practice. Um, and practice including in the media, in literature, in, um, in education, and a whole range of uh, areas that, that language, is, uh, language is used. Um, and then we have um, a third stream that is, uh, which uh, Phil has brought in here with the, in relation to the uh, Higher Education Academy and how it uh, supports uh, this particular area. So, Maybe that, that we could, from this particular, emerging from this, uh, could um, suggest a few developments that might be helpful. So obviously, you know, um, this is an ongoing process. Maybe we could also do that after the after the event, and then we will we'll be in touch. And I'm preparing a report for the Higher Education Academy on this particular theme of connecting the same thing, connecting cultures, um, uh, internationalization, and common languages. So the idea of using Commonwealth languages as, as a way of um, internationalization uh, in, in several domains of use of language. Uh, so it is not the question of English versus the rest, or, uh, but it is a question of in what domains do we use English, in what domains do we use others, in how they can, in a way, uh, work in synergy, in a way to produce uh, a linguistically competent population in Commonwealth whose linguistic repertoire is, is fully recognized and therefore not left with the feeling that a part of their inheritance, a part of their expertise is less valued than some part of their, their expertise. So, so with this particular thing in mind, I think maybe we should have uh, um, some input from Phil about how the Higher Education Academy is dealing with these issues. And also they're dealing with internationalization in a way because Higher Education Academy is one of the pioneers in terms of teaching and learning in higher education and therefore there is interest in, um, from other countries in the way it, 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 it's able to support teaching and learning. So there is a sort of an internationalization in which they, they are involved and maybe should give uh, the floor to, uh, to Phil to, to tell us about how the HEA can support this particular process. Okay, thanks, thanks Father. Uh, well, as I, as I see it, there are two principal um, definitions of, of internationalization. The first concerns uh, international students coming to the UK um, and, and the ways in which uh, we seek to improve their student experience. Uh, but the other side of the coin is really looking at internationalizing the curriculum uh, for British students. Uh, so ensuring, for example, uh, that more and more British students um, or students in this country uh, for example, go abroad um, and, uh, and uh, uh, take up a placement abroad, for example, either as a work placement um, or, or um, going abroad to study, for example. Uh, and over the next year or two, um, the HEA is funding um, an initiative to the tune of £100,000 looking at uh, the themes of languages, interculturalism, and student international mobility specifically. Um, and this is something that we're working on in collaboration with a number of different organizations throughout the sector. But um, what I'd really welcome your input on, really, is um, your thoughts on how uh, we could ensure that students in this country can get the best experience abroad, uh, and ideas, really, for um, for, for that strategic initiative, how can uh, the student experience be internationalised? Uh, and how can we ensure that students do take advantage of um, all of the opportunities that exist um, for study and work abroad? Thank you. And um, and we've got this one in it for anybody who wants to make oh, a specific. If, if you don't mind me making a comment. Please. Um, yes, that's the time for I, that. I have to say I've been very interested in the conference. I think it's a really, really fascinating area. Um, but I think what's happening now is, is actually quite interesting in terms of language. Because what you're talking about are really complex, subtle 
um, kind of historical relationship to language. So one of the things that really struck me about the talk about Malta was when we were talking about, uh, you know, if you don't mind me repeat, repeating it, just about yourself as a mother wanting your children to, to speak Maltese, and, but also wanted them, wanting them to get ahead and understanding that it, for, for them to do that, they also have to speak another language and that there are some losses there. So we're talking about mother tongues. We're talking about mother tongues in conflict with an imposter in many ways, or in terms of a patriarch, or in terms of money. You know, when you talk about publishing, and you say, you know, the publishing world very much uh, focuses on writers from particular areas of the world. This is not just to do with money, this is also to do, obviously, with control. Now, what do you do? Do you set up publishing houses that have the same model, which is also about control? So you say, everybody has to write in English which is not necessarily their first language. And what I'm trying to say, very awkwardly, is that here we all, there's so few of us here, and yet at the end of the day, we have one minute <laughs> to speak <laughs> freely <laughs> about language. For me, that's really problematic, because it, what it means is that language, again, has been controlled and manipulated yeah, by the institution. And I, and I want to say, I want to offer a challenge, which is that, here we have this day. I know there are practical reasons why people haven't turned up. The only two people here who are not speakers are, are African Caribbean. But there are no African Caribbean people represented on the panel when you're talking about connecting cultures. This kind of institutional thoughtlessness when you're thinking about this subject matter is also to do with language. Yeah, It's also to do with... Um, uh, invisibility in terms of language. And so for me, it's unacceptable that we've only got one minute. Yeah? Because what we're also talking about is having to trans... I'm having to... I speak only English, and yet I have another language that I don't even know, that I have to hear while I'm hearing the language I do know. And so that means part of what I need is more space, and we're not being offered that. Yeah, because this is very, this is this is very institutionalized, and that's problematic when you're talking about connecting cultures. It's very problematic because you need the time and you need the space in order to do that. You can't do it the way the patriarch has done it, and then expect it to be new. That's my challenge. So I, I want to ask. I know we've got a comfort break. I don't really know what that means. <laughs> sure, please uh, go ahead. Yes, it's uh, just we were trying to... Uh, to you, you're asking us for right. something very specific, but what I'm trying to say is that actually part of what is necessary is to allow people to speak rather than always directing the language and the conversation. Does that make sense? So for me, what's important is to talk about what has happened today. And some of the things, and I want an opportunity to reflect with the other participants on what has happened today. Does that make sense? Um, it, it does, and um, I, I did mention that you know that, that the, the, the dialogue can continue, and I'm going to email you the, the websites and things like that, so we can um, like you know keep keep a, a, a website. You know, I'll keep this option open for another. 15 days, uh, so we can always uh, contact and exchange opinion over the, uh, over the internet, um, uh, and that, that way, you know, the, the dialogue can continue. I know this is a, a one-day event, uh, and therefore, you know, uh, there are some constraints in terms of how much time we could have. But the, the I take the point that you are mentioning, uh, you, men you mentioned, and we uh, we try to balance um, different things, and uh, it's. Um, um, and and in, in that particular sense, although it's not any um, very conscious pigeon holding, but certainly we tried to have more people, uh, and and certainly um, we had one speaker um, who could have given us a bit more about um, Uganda, about Africa. But unfortunately, he has uh, not been able to come. So so in that sense, we have uh, and again, you know, Africa presented itself in a different form while examining. Mal Mal Maltese uh, uh, literature and, and the way North Africa was also uh, 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 written as well as physical presence. So 
Um, I, I do take this particular point, and then uh, I will. Um, so please do fill in the, the form with your email and, and address, uh, in email address, and I will get in touch with you with the summary of what we've been talking today, and also any points that you want to continue as a form of discussion. And I, 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 um, I take your point about uh, privileging particular languages and vis a vis others. But this is a, is a process which, um, which, which, is a, which has to be um, seen. And in, in, in many ways, people uh, can confront that by being conscious of the, of the process. And certainly, from an organizational point of view, uh, there are certain dynamics which organizations do, do follow. And recognizing that, but certainly, the, the change has to come from within. The change has to come from bottom up in some ways. And that, that's where I think you know, your, your point is very important, that the, that the conflict that Stella mentioned about having to choose between English and Maltese, and then the, how the particular choice has been made uh, in, in, in the case, and how it kept shifting with the change in the school instruction, the language of instruction in the school. So, uh, and, and what Vijay mentioned about the, 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 the idea of uh, prizes in, uh, at the moment for um, literature produced in English, and the question whether it can be extended mm -hmm. is again another facet of this particular continuum of, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, change that, uh, that has to go on. And, um, and I take your point, so you're welcome uh, to email me, and I will email the, the, the first place with all the uh, information that's being provided so that you know, you're able to relate to it, and you can look at the information on the higher education website and Commonwealth uh, Foundation website, and then we, we continue the dialogue. But for the time being, uh, with one more minute, so to speak, metaphorically, uh, we will uh, head towards uh, coffee and also because the speakers have other uh, commitments uh, and, and therefore we, we need to use another form or, and, and this is not a closure uh, that I'm, I'm seeking but it is uh, a start. In, in, a, in a different way, in an informed way, because we have been informed in, in several ways about the context, about the attention, and, and how we can uh, become conscious of them and how we can contribute to some sort of change. So, uh, with that in mind, maybe I give uh, time for Phil and Vijay to, to complete the session. Well, I wanted to say really was, was that conferences of this nature always depend, of course, on, on everyone's schedules uh, and, and uh, this is a particularly uh, busy time of the year. Um, however, um, HEA does want to facilitate this kind of discussion um, and there are resources to support it. Uh, and as Bala mentioned before, Bala's um, compiling a report uh, on the theme uh, of today's conference. And we certainly welcome everyone's input, um, whether um, you're, you happen to have been able to come today um, or not, uh, we welcome your in input uh, for that particular report. Uh, so do please contact Barla um, if, if, you'd, um, if you'd like to contribute in some way to that. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Nothing much to add really, but apart from thank you for listening. I'm sorry for taking up a bit too much time that could have been dedicated to a um, broader discussion. <laughs> I think you know uh, we close the this part of the conference to close, and as you know, there is a, another lecture which is the annual, which is one of the annual lectures of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, named after uh, a person who is almost synonymous with the institute in terms of its history. Uh, so that goes on from that, that from five to, from six to seven. After that, there is a reception, and it is uh, being delivered uh, by the senior professor from the uh, University of Texas. Uh, so I hope you know you'll be able to stay on and uh, attend to that uh, and attend that lecture as well. But certainly uh, we will keep in touch and continue this particular discussion.